Well, good morning, guys. Saints, ye saints of the Lord, as the song says. Um, <clears throat> did you know? Did you know that you, if you're in Christ, that you're a saint? That's not a Roman Catholic thing. That's a. That is a a designation that the scripture gives to those who belong to Jesus. They are saints, the, the, the sanctified ones, those who have been chosen and set apart, specifically consecrated is the is a word you could use. Consecrated, set apart, set aside for God's purposes. You are saints of the living God. Did you know that? You don't have to like go live your life in Kolkata. You could, but you don't have to. You, you, if you're in Christ, you have been set apart, you belong to him, you're for his purposes, you are saints of the living God. You are, according to Ephesians 4, light. You are light. You are, according to Matthew 5, the light of the world. You are, according to Ephesians 4, the temple of the living God. That means that the God of the universe dwells in you. You're his dwelling place. Together, us as a church, we are the dwelling place of the living God. We are, according to Ephesians chapter 4, the people of the household of God. You're members of God's very household. You are, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17, a new creation. You are, according to Romans 5, a new humanity. There is a second Adam, and his name is Jesus, and he is the head of a new humanity. And if you are in Christ, you're part of that. That's awesome. It is awesome to be a Christian. It is awesome to be a new creation. You should know that. You should know that that's the identity that God has given to us as his children. And it's important for you to know that because if you do, um, you will love people better. We've been talking a lot about uh, love in recent weeks and the call upon our lives as the people of God to love one another. Remember, we've been in in John, we were in John 13 several months back, talking about, uh, Jesus says, by this the world will know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. And then just a few weeks ago, we're in John 15, in that passage, that really famous passage about the vine and the branches. Jesus is the vine, we're the branches. We have to abide in him so that we bear much fruit. When when we bear fruit, we prove that that we're his disciples. And then he says, he says, he switches from the vine and the branches imagery to friendship imagery. And he says, if you obey my commandments, you're demonstrating that you are indeed my friends. Bearing fruit, obeying his commandments demonstrates that you're a disciple. It demonstrates that you're a friend of Jesus. And here's the fruit, here's the commandment that we ought to be walking in. Love one another. That's how you demonstrate that your friend of Jesus is your love for one another. And I've been thinking about this call to love each other. And uh, the reality is it's very, very hard to do. In fact, I said a couple weeks ago, the kind of love that Jesus is talking about here is the mark of the Christian community. They will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. And that means this kind of love is a kind of love that you can't have unless you're abiding in the vine. There's something distinct about the Christian community and its love for one another. Jesus talks about it a little bit in John 15 when he says, he defines this love. He says, greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. That's hard to do. It's very hard to lay down your life for your friends for a couple of reasons. Uh, we mentioned a few weeks ago, number one, I already have a great love affair with me. (laughs) I love myself, and I'm supposed to lay down my life? No way. I want to keep my life. I love my life, and I'm supposed to lay down my life for my friends. There's two problems here. One, I love self. Two, people get ugly, 
And I got to love people that get ugly sometimes. That means that it's hard. That's even impossible for, the, for self to be dead enough that, that I would give self for the good of others. And I've been thinking about this call to love other people. I've been thinking about how hard it is. And my friend Matt Brown down at Redemption Church in Loveland said, oh, we just went through a four or maybe a five-part series on resolving conflict. I thought, oh, I think that is one of the most common and one of the most difficult scenarios in which that call to love another person can exist. It is very hard to love people, and it's very hard to love people in the midst of conflict with people. Because in conflict, um, self looms large, and people get really ugly, don't they? So it's really hard to love people when self is big and people are being ugly. And so I thought, here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to focus on conflict, and we're going to just think of it as an extended meditation on the call to love one another. We're going to do a four-part series on resolving uh, everyday conflict. We're going to look at the, where does conflict come from? Well, what are typical responses to conflict? What does the Bible say we should do in terms of responding to conflict? Uh, how, how does God give us help to be able to do this? We're going to look at the biblical roadmap for resolving everyday conflict, and um, we're going to be using uh, this book by Ken Sandy and Kevin Johnson, Resolving Everyday Conflict, and you should buy it, you should read it, and when you do, you'll be able to see that I really have nothing new to say. I'm not plagiarizing the next four weeks because I am citing my source right now, (laughs) okay? Everything I'm going to say pretty much is coming straight out of this which makes my sermon prep uh, a little bit lighter for a season, and I think it will just really help our church body because uh, conflict is everywhere. Conflict is in the home, it's in the office, it's in the church, it's in the neighborhood. We uh, We had a situation in our neighborhood where there were some dogs that were out of control, and the HOA had to get involved, and things almost got legal. There's conflict everywhere. Divorce is the evidence of some conflict, right? Child custody battles is the evidence of some serious conflict. Church splits, lawsuits, ugly battles for refunds, for bad food. That is, is the evidence of, a co- of conflict. It's, it's, every, it's everywhere, and um, it's very normal. What's not normal is resolving it well, because people don't love well in the midst of conflict, because self is looming large, and people are getting real ugly. So that's where we're going to park um, for a while, and I just, by way of kind of preparing us, I just want to ask you to join me in acknowledging right up front that we're dealing, this is like heart surgery stuff. We're dealing with self. We're dealing with the confrontation of self, which means we're dealing with pride. We're dealing with humility. We're dealing with selfishness. We're dealing with desires and wants and conflicting desires and conflict, (laughs) conflict. It's heart surgery. I just want you to know, um, if we're going to look at this in a healthy way, we're going to have to look at ourselves. We're going to have to be real and honest about what's inside of us. And um, I just want you to kind of, well, let's do this. Let's close our eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And here's what I want us to do. I want us to ask God if he will be honest, if he will be honest, if he will help us to be honest with ourselves. And if he will help us to let ourselves be changed. Can you do that? Can you take a moment? Maybe even just 
Repeat after me in your heart. Lord, will you help me be willing to be changed? Will you help me be willing to have my heart worked on? Thank you, Lord. Who in here wants peace with other people? Who in here wants to live at peace with other people? Right? We're, we've all, we're all tasting it, have tasted it, we're going to taste it. Maybe before you leave here today, heart surgery is the path that we have to take if we want to live at peace with other people. So here's what we're going to do. Two topics we're going to look at today. One, the nature of conflict. And two, the hope of the gospel as it relates to conflict. The nature of conflict and the hope of the gospel. Let's start with the nature of conflict. Have you ever thought about this? Where does conflict come from? What's its source? What's at the core of conflict? When you're in the midst of a conflict, uh, what's going on? What's happening right now? Some tension. Um, you might say, well, conflict comes from a lot of places, right? Perhaps you could say that conflict comes from diversity. Uh, this person is kind of like this, and this person is kind of like this. You've got um, people who plan really well, and people who are pretty at ease being spontaneous. We got some planners in here? Got some spontaneous in here? Okay. Diversity. We've got spenders. It's like easy to spend. And we've got savers. Got any savers in here? Got any spenders in here? <laughs> Wirings, preferences. Um, Diversity is a good thing. It's not a, it's not a bad thing that we've got spenders and savers. The planners are not more virtuous than the spontaneous. You need them both, actually. That's healthy. That, that creates good dynamics in a, in a family. It creates good dynamics in a, in a church. The savers help the spenders to be responsible, <laughs> The spenders help the savers to be generous. Really, really do. Diversity is a good thing, and it actually can contribute to conflict, but it's not the core cause of conflict per se. Um, diversity. What about misunderstanding? Maybe is misunderstanding a contributor? Yeah, it's a contributor to conflict. People fail to clearly say sometimes what they mean, and sometimes people fail to hear or to listen to what's being said. Several years ago, my grandfather was dying of cancer, and in his frail final days, uh, I asked him um, in his living room with kind of a bunch of people around, I said, Grandpa, do you have any goals? And he said, well got some watch cases. I said, oh, no, not gold. Do you have any goals? <laughs> uh, just a misunderstanding. What kind of conflict could arise from that kind of misunderstanding? None did. But you could, like, you just play that out in the wrong, in the wrong, uh, with the wrong ingredients, and you've got a lot of trouble in that situation. Misunderstandings happen all the time. That can certainly contribute to conflict, but misunderstanding is not the core cause of conflict per se. The core cause of conflict resides in the heart. Open your Bibles, James chapter 4. Let's read it again, verses 1 and 2. What causes quarrels? And what causes fights among y'all? <laughs> Is it not this, that your passions are at war within 
(laughs) y'all. You desire and do not have, so you murder. Thinking of Jesus talking about hatred, and it's, it's scary connection to murder in the Sermon on the Mount. You desire and you don't have, and so you'll murder people. Or you covet, I want, I want that so bad, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. What's the cause? What is the cause of conflict? What is the cause of fighting, the cause of quarreling? The core cause of conflict comes from this. Somebody is not getting what they want, what they desire, what they long for, what they covet, what they are passionate about. You can have a planner You can have a spontaneous person, you can have a spender, you can have a saver, and you don't necessarily have conflict. You could have a misunderstanding, and you don't necessarily have conflict. Conflict begins to occur when the saver wants to save and the spender wants to spend the same thing. They both want to do something, and those wants are not compatible with each other. And now you have a conflict of interests or a conflict of desires. Conflict begins to occur when the misunderstanding produces the appearance that somebody's not going to get what they want, like gold watches, for example. If that's what you really wanted. Conflict is birthed when you have a clash of desires. Now, just because you have a clash of desires doesn't necessarily mean the conflict has become uh, sinful. Doesn't mean that sin has automatically occurred. Just because I want to go to bed late and my wife wants to go to bed early doesn't mean that things got nasty yet. Yet. Doesn't mean that like we've 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 sinned against each other. It's just, it's just apparent, oh, this is what I want, and this is what you want, and those things aren't co- compatible. However, sin is not far away at this moment. And in many instances, that's right where it goes. Because when we want something and we are threatened with the possibility of not having it, we have a propensity to get bent out of shape. The sinful nature is ready to pounce when there are unfulfilled desires. I'm going to say that again. The sinful nature is ready to pounce when there are unfulfilled desires. Just know that about yourself. Ooh, this just, okay, this just comes to mind. Cain and Abel. Grab your Bible. Go to, where's my Bible? Can I say this? Go to, go to Genesis. Go to Genesis. <laughs> I hope this works out. <laughs> ah. Genesis. Chapter 4. Hmm. Verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So uh, Cain wanted something, and he didn't get it. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will it not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. An unfulfilled desire, and sin is crouching, and its desire is for you to take you down. The sinful nature is unquestionably devoted to self. 
It, it just, that's just the default. Self, fulfillment of self's desires, exaltation of self. And when self gets crossed, trouble is not far away. You, you, you just, you, maybe you wanted to eat somewhere else. And wife V did not want to. And self gets crossed. And husband does not respond well. Uh, maybe you just wanted to have a little bit of downtime. Maybe that's what you wanted. And it's not working out, and self is being crossed, and sin is not far. Or maybe you wanted to live a certain type of lifestyle, and as the years go by, you realize this is not what I wanted. And self has been crossed, and sin is not far. Watch your heart in that moment. Maybe you thought that... You were right in, the, maybe that's just, you just want to be right. And it turns out that something's threatening that. You want to be thought well of, and something's threatening that. You want to be respected, and something's threatening that. And self has been crossed, and sin is not far away. It's ready to pounce. Its desire is for you. You have to watch it. You see, human beings are designed by God to be creatures of Desire. Now, that's actually a good thing. We are not Buddhists. Buddhism teaches that desire is bad because desires lead to pain. So if you want to eliminate pain from your life, you've got to kill desire. That's a goal. We're not, we're not Buddhists. Christians are okay with pain. We believe that... You are supposed to feel. Your life is, is, is to be filled. Your heart is to be filled with desire. Will that lead to pain? I think it will. It will. You'll feel. You'll feel joy. You'll feel disappointment. The fact that you have desires is not a problem. The problem is that our sinful nature gets a hold of those desires and then turns them into something monstrous. The problem is that the flesh takes those desires and turns them into inordinate desires, out-of-order desires, desires that desire too much, desires that desire the wrong things. Desire, it sinks its root deeper and deeper into the heart and the sinful nature just takes it there and what we want begins to morph into a demand and when the sin nature infects those desires, this is where a harmless conflict can turn into a sinful conflict and you have a morphing. I want turns into I must turns into I demand, turns into I will, turns into you should, turns into you didn't, turns into you're going to pay. The desire is driving deeper. Sin is taking that desire deeper and deeper. It's growing. It's turning monstrous. Things get ugly when harmless desires morph into what Paul refers to as sinful passions in Romans 7 or in Ephesians chapter 2, the passions of our flesh. And now my desire to stay up late is more than just a simple hankering that I have. It has actually been infected with the sin nature and that desire is turning into an insistent and life-controlling craving that actually starts to get ugly. And that means that in my heart, here's what we have, the birth of a God. My desire has turned into great worshipful passion to stay up late. I went to um, 
Maryland several years back with a group of guys that I was going to school with in Minneapolis. We went to a, a church there, and there were a bunch of kids playing in one of the gyms, and we, we were watching these kids play, um, and they, were, they had a ball. They were fighting over the ball, and one of the kids kind of stops. So it's incredible self-awareness for an eight-year-old. And he goes, guys, I think this ball is an idol. <laughs> Wow, good job, mom and dad. (laughs) Holy cow. They had given this kid a framework for understanding what's going on when I'm fighting with people. What am I loving so much right now that I would do this to that kid? This is a worship issue. Anytime conflict has gotten ugly and sinful, this is what is happening. Someone had a desire, and their will was crossed, so they're not getting what they want, and the flesh kicks in and then corrupts those desires so that they dig their roots deep down, and they now become idolatrous, and now I'm living for them, and they are in control of me, and I'm acting like a slave, and I'm actually even willing to damage others in order to grab hold of whatever it is that I want. And it could be simple, simple things. Anything that you're having conflict over. Who in here has gotten in major conflict over like stupid stuff? It's not about the stuff. It is not about the stuff. That's, you, you hear this in marriages all the time. It's like, what, what are you guys fighting over? It's like, I, I didn't want butter put on my toast before I wanted to put it on myself. It's like, are you kidding me? You guys are like about to tear each other's eyes out. It's not about the toast. It's about the heart. It's about this incredible worship malfunction that's taking place inside each and every one of us. You can stop yourself in the midst of your next sinful conflict. You can say to yourself, somebody's not getting what they want. I think this ball's an idol. That's what's happening. And in all likelihood, it's happening in both hearts. <laughs> Not always, but my heart, your heart, both hearts. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You're having a love affair, you are turning from the fountain of living waters and you are trying to satisfy yourself with, the, with broken cisterns that can hold no water. It's crazy, but it's what, that's what happens. We are, we are made to worship by the Lord Jesus Christ. He made us to worship. He made us with desires and we have a worship disorder. That's what sin has done to us so that we are in love with the dumbest stuff. This is a Christian diagnosis of sinful conflict. It's a unique lens, I think, that allows us to look at conflict from a different perspective than the world looks at conflict. When the world looks at conflict, really the only tool that they have for resolving conflict is to emphasize the resolution of those differences, right? You want to go to bed at 9? You want to go to bed at midnight? Well, let's see if we can find a time. It's not about the time, ultimately. I mean, that contributes, but that, that's not the core cause of the conflict. That's a strictly pragmatic approach to resolving conflict. Find some middle ground. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it fails to recognize what's at the heart. It fails to recognize the nature of what's actually going on here. The Christian has a unique lens to see what's actually happening. And that means that the Christian also has a unique solution to the problem. 
when we understand that the true cause of sinful conflict is worship gone wrong, it opens a way to a unique solution. The Christian's method for resolving conflict understands that it's not just a matter of differences here. Resolving sinful conflict is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of coming to terms with our own tendency to idolize our preferences. It's a matter of coming to terms with your own heart's ferocious agenda to serve yourself. You've got to know that about yourself. Conflict resolution from a biblical perspective requires the transformation of our sinfully idolatrous and selfish hearts, which means that in any given conflict, my greatest problem, my greatest threat is me. In any given conflict, my main problem is not you and it's not the circumstances, it's something inside of me. It's my own propensity to start going to war against you, not love you, go to war against you in order to preserve my idols. My own heart, therefore, must change. True conflict resolution from a Christian perspective requires heart change. You know what that means? Our only hope is Jesus. Because you can't change your heart. And that's the core of the issue. Our only hope for truly living as a peacemaker is Jesus Christ because he alone has the power to change my heart. So here's the second thing I want to talk about today, the power of the gospel, the hope of the gospel for idolaters for the sake of conflict resolution. The hope of the gospel for idolaters. We live in a world that, of course, is feeding us constantly this message of take care of number one, you got to take care of yourself. you got to fight for yourself. Even in conflict, look out for number one. We have come to believe, however, in a God who says, I want you to look out for number two. <laughs> I want you to lay down your life in love for another person. And by His grace, and it's only by His grace, we have in response as Christians, we've said, yes, Lord. Yeah, I... I be actually believe that. I can see that that's a good thing. I, I agree that it is good that I would look out for others, that I would lay my life down for others. That's compelling. That's beautiful. But as we've already talked about, it's very hard. In fact, it's an impossible command to obey in yourself. You have to have supernatural help to do this because changing your heart is not merely about making a decision to just... Change the heart. The prophet Jeremiah says, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Okay, a black man, can he change his skin color? Or the leopard, his spots? Then also you can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. And the point is, they can't and therefore you can't. <laughs> you have no more power to change, to transform your own heart than a leopard has to change the spots on its fur. It's not a matter of willpower. It's a matter of God's creative work in our lives. And especially when we're in the midst of conflict with somebody which some of you probably are even right now, we especially feel the limits of our own abilities. I'm supposed to love this jerk right now, and I'm bothered. I'm, I'm hurt. I'm ticked. I just don't have it in me to love this person right now. I feel the, the limits. I don't want peace. I want victory. <laughs> 
We can't change our hearts. But check it out. All praise, all glory, all honor be to the God who can. He most certainly can change your heart. God can make you a loving person. Even in the midst of conflict, God can make you a loving person so that you aren't ruled by sin in that moment. You're not ruled by selfishness in that moment. You're not a slave to your desires when you don't get your own way. God can help you so that you are more concerned about the glory of His name, more concerned about the good of the person that you're in conflict with than you are concerned with securing your idols. He can do this in us. And that transformation begins not with something that you need to do today. It begins with something that has already been done for you. In fact, there are four things I want you to know this morning, four bits of good news that I want you to know and I want you to believe, four gospel truths about what God has done already in order to give you and me the ability to love others even in the midst of conflict. Here's the first one. Though we were hostile towards God, God has loved us and made peace with us through His Son. You were hostile toward Him, and yet He loved you and made peace with you. Colossians chapter 1 reads like this, verse 21. And you who were alienated, what's that mean? On the outside. And hostile in mind, hating God. You who were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless blameless and above reproach before Him. So there's a conflict. There was a conflict between me and God. A hostility between us. I hated Him. You did too. You hated His rule over you. You did not want God to tell you how to live. You wanted to be God. You wanted to be in control of your own life. So did I. We were hostile in mind. We hated Him. And because of that, we were alienated from Him. His wrath was set toward us. There was conflict, and in the midst of that conflict, He loved us. We're on the outside. We're alienated. And even though He knows the fullness of our hostility towards Him, He lovingly reconciles us to Himself by means of His Son, by means of a death that pays the penalty that we deserve so that we are presented without blemish in God's presence. We have peace with God. I want you to know that this morning. Your God made peace with you in the midst of conflict. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. That is awesome news for us. God has taken the first step of making you and me peacemakers by allowing us to experience the peacemaking love of the Lord Jesus. But it's not the only thing he did. Here's the second thing he did. Here's the second bit of good news. God has begun to change who you are. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Christians have not only been reconciled to God, but you have begun to transform. This is already underway in the life of every 
Christian in this room. You have been born again. A new life is underway. A new humanity has been birth. You believe that. Do you believe that Jesus Christ not only reconciled you to God and not only secured for you an eternity to come, but that he has also began a new work in you so that a new nature has dawned within you and you are right now no longer a hopeless slave to sin. Do you believe that? I want you to believe that. Guys, you are not slaves to sin. Paul says to the Romans, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. If you're in him, that's the truth. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll never sin again. It doesn't mean that you won't struggle against your old sin nature as long as you are tied to this age through your present body you will have to wage war against sin because sin is waging war against you. But guys, you are not slaves to it any longer. That has passed away with the death of the Lord Jesus. And your union to Him means that His death counts for you. And the old enslaver, sin, is not your master. Praise be to God. You are a new creation. It's already a reality. There's a fundamental shift in your eternal identity that has taken place and a supernatural power has now been planted in you and we are new creations and therefore there's a new ability, young and undeveloped as it may be in each one of us, there is a new ability to be free from the power of sin and the slavery of self. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, Uh, 15, just two verses before the new creation verse that I just read, he says this, He died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and gave Himself up for them. He died for you so that you will not have to be enslaved anymore to yourself. And you're saying, well, how? Okay, great, that's great. I don't want to be a slave to myself, but how? Two verses later, you're a new creation. Do you believe it? This is not wishful thinking. It's not something that only mature Christians have access to. It's a a reality. It's news. This is news. It's reality for every Christian in here. I am not asking you whether or not you feel the news. I'm asking, will you believe the news? It's true. He has, one, loved you and made peace with you through His Son. Two, He has now begun to change who you are. There's a third bit of good news. He is, current, he is currently changing you into a more Christ-like person. He not only began the change, but He is currently changing you. That's part of what comes with the package of salvation. Salvation is not merely something that you received in the past. Salvation is not merely something that is a promise for a glorious future. Your salvation includes your ongoing transformation right now. There's not a Christian in this room that's not currently being changed more and more into the resemblance of of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's part of what he purchased for you at Calvary. If you're abiding in Jesus, and Jesus is in us by the Spirit, then fruit growth is underway. We're being pruned so that we can be more fruitful. God is at work within you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You're being transformed from one degree of glory to another. So God has loved you and made peace with you. God has begun to transform you into an entirely new person. God is right now in the process of continuing to change you progressively. And number four, God has already made plans to use you. He already has plans to use the new changed you. It's already written in his book. Check it out. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 40. We are his workmanship Created in Christ Jesus. New creation. You're a new creation. You've been created in Christ Jesus. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
He already prepared good works for you and me to do as his new creation people to walk in. He's already got a plan for how he wants to use you in order to bring out this new creation identity. And one of the plans he wants to use you in, one of the ways in which he plans to use you is in conflict. You're looking at the conflict in your life right now, and you're like, there is no hope for this conflict. And I'm telling you, God plans to use you in and through that conflict. It is not a hopeless situation. God can use his new creation people and plans to do it. That's awesome! God has loved you and made peace with you, Through his son, he he has begun to change who we are. He is changing us, and he plans to use us. It's good news for people who experience conflict and people who are in need of help so that their hearts can love people in the midst of that conflict. Some of you are feeling the limits of that love. You're experiencing conflict, and you want peace, right? like, I want peace. I don't like this tension. But I just do not know how to get there. I cannot. I just can't see my way through this. And I don't, and I, and I don't know how I'm going to get my heart on board with this whole peace thing. You just can't see it. Self is so strong. Self is so persistent. Here's the reality. You and me are in need of God's grace. And the gospel tells us that God can change the heart. And if you're trusting in Jesus, the work is already underway. So you're not stuck. You are not stuck. That's good news this morning. You're not stuck. Whatever is going on, if it's marriage stuff, if it's financial stuff, if it's friendship stuff, if it's family stuff, you're not stuck. God made peace with you. He's at work in your life, changing your heart, and he wants to use you. When we talk about resolving everyday conflict, that's where we need to start. We're going to get really practical in the weeks to come, but but for now, I simply want you to hear this, and I want you to believe this. Because of what God has done for you, because of who he has now made you, because he is at work in your life, and because he has plans to use you, you can change. And you can become a more loving person and you can pursue peace. I want you to just hear that and I want you to just believe that. You can be the kind of person who shines his glory by the way that you make peace with others. I just want you to hear it and I just want you to believe it. He can shine his glory by the way you make peace with other people. He'll help us. And for the next three weeks, we'll continue exploring how to pursue that together.